A few years back, a 65-year-old woman uh, named Deborah Hamill um, was pulled over at a, at a traffic stop light. Uh, not a traffic light, but it was a, uh, she had a broken tail light. So she was pulled over, and uh, the, the police officer came to uh, give her a ticket for her broken tail light. But in the process of that, she wasn't cooperating well with the police officer, and she ended up getting tased as a result of this whole ordeal. 65-year-old woman. And it all was because she was being belligerent. She was not cooperating at all. She refused to sign the ticket. Uh, just It kind of escalated over time. The, the, the order after order after over, order that the police officer gave her, she, she refused to obey. Um, and she eventually she wanted to just leave the traffic stop altogether without being uh, released to go. And um, Now, right or wrong, there was a huge ordeal about whether the police officer was, uh, whether he should have used that kind of force. But the, the fact is that she was tased in the process because she, re, she refused to rebel, uh, she refused to comply and she rebelled against the police officer's authority. Now the truth is, we've all rebelled against authority. We've all rebelled against God's authority. And, and by nature, we do this because we are children of wrath, the Bible says, and that's what we're going to be seeing today in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We all have a natural inclination to rebel against authority, whether that be you know, the teachers that we have at school or our parents or whatever it is. We like to see what we can get away with going our own way rather than doing what is asked of us by those in authority. All of us, in fact, from birth, have rebelled against God's authority and that reality has very dire consequences for us. Because we've rebelled against God's authority, because we've refused to see him as the authority of our lives, who has the right to tell us what to do, who to be, where to go, what to think, what to believe, and how to live our lives, because we've rebelled against God, we all deserve hell. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our thoughts and flesh. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge this reality that we've all been children of wrath. We've all sinned against you. We've all been disobedient. We see from your word over and over and over again how even the people that you've made and displayed your glory to have rebelled against you. And that includes us. God, we acknowledge our sin we turn to Jesus. And we pray this morning that we would all see and remember just how much Jesus has done for us, how much you love us, and that in you we are not dead but alive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We were reminded uh, a couple of weeks ago, the last time I was with you on Easter, that though Jesus was dead and in the grave, he was raised to life. He was raised to life. And we saw on Easter that the tomb was not Full. Jesus was not there on Easter morning, the, the resurrection morning. Jesus was uh, raised from the dead. He, By God's power, the Father's power, and by his own power, Jesus was able to come to life out of the grave and, and, and leave the grave so that the grave was empty on Easter morning. And Scripture reminds us today that we also were dead. We also were dead. In fact, the reason I bring up Easter isn't just because it was two weeks ago. But actually, there's a very clear link between uh, our scripture today and, uh, and the fact that Jesus was risen from the grave. If you back up to, to Ephesians chapter 1, uh, this is the logical progression. It says, he, God, exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. 
and everything has been subjected under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So that was what we read last time we were together going through Ephesians. Where we gave thanks for Christ that Jesus did that, that he rose from the grave. And then we see in verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So just as Jesus was dead and came to life, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. See, we were dead in a different way than Jesus died. Jesus did not die for the sins that he committed because he committed no sins. Jesus was perfect in every way. He lived the perfect life that we failed to live and then he died the death that we all deserve to die, but he did it in our place. See, Jesus died not for his sins, but for ours. But we die, we were dead because of the sins that we ourselves committed. And we've all done this. We can all look at our own lives and, and recognize various ways in which we've sinned, that we've uh, disobeyed God. We, we can read the Bible's commands and say, yep, I fall short of that one. I fall short of that one. I've done that. Yes. Uh, I was listening to a comedian this last week. I can't remember which one it was. But he said he acknowledged that he broke nine of the Ten Commandments. Nine of the Ten. He said he's never killed anyone yet, is what he says. But then he also acknowledged that he did break it in spirit because he's read the, the New Testament where it says that, that uh, even if we commit, uh, if we hate our brother, if we, if we don't love our brother, that's as if we've killed them in our hearts uh, when we hate people. So in truth, we've all broken all the commandments. We've all sinned against God. See, sin is not just what we consider the big things. Murder, adultery, depending on who you are, being a Democrat or Republican, uh, sin isn't just the big things, right? It's, it's the small things, too. It's, do you love your neighbor from the heart? Are you going to be generous with your neighbor? Sin is, sin is any time that we've missed the mark. Sin is missing the mark. It's this analogy of, um, uh, a, you know, a bullseye on, on a, uh, whether it's darts or, or, or archery. The bullseye is the mark. That's what we're aiming for. And sin is anything, anytime we've missed it, if we hadn't hit that bullseye, the Bible calls that sin. That's the, that's the, that's the word that is used for sin. There's, there's two words in this passage. One is that, that uh, sin is missing the mark. That's sin. And it also says trespasses. And that's the idea that you've wandered off the right path. And both of these mean basically the same thing. It, it, it's not being on the path, not hitting the mark that God has for each one of us. We've all missed the mark in life. We've all wandered off that path of glorifying God with all of our actions. See, sin has caused us to be spiritually dead even while we're physically alive. You know, we can all talk about how we've all, um, even as we've lived our lives, we've sought to do good, and sometimes we've just, we look back at things and said, I don't know how I got, how I got it so wrong, where I wandered from the path. We've all done it. We've all done it. Even while we're physically alive, sin causes us to be spiritually dead. There's a flower nicknamed the, the corpse flower. Have you, have you heard of this before, the corpse flower? Uh, that illustrates what we're like. Uh, the corpse flower is this flower that when it opens up, it looks like rotten flesh. Uh, and it smells putrid. It stinks like rotten flesh as well. In fact, a lot of other animals will come by thinking that they're, they're going to have a meal, you know, because they, they enjoy to eat rotten flesh. They come to this flower, and they, they smell it, they look at it, they even try to lick it a little bit, and they realize right away that's not what they were looking for. That's not what they were looking for. They, so the things that might eat flowers don't, don't co go near it because they, see, they think it's rotten flesh, but then the things that they want to eat that flower, they, or they want to eat rotten flesh, they don't uh, in, end up eating it either because they realize that it's not what they wanted. So we're the same way. You know, we look like we're physically well, and we look like we're, we're you know, alive and, and living life, but then when you start digging deeper, we're, we're not what we appear to be. We're dead even as we walk. A dead person can do nothing. We don't produce fruit. We don't give others uh, what they need in life. We don't truly love people as God has loved us. A dead person can do nothing. A dead person may appear alive, appear alive but produces no root. It says also that we were dead even while we walked. Verse 2, 
It says, in which you previously walked or lived according to the ways of the world. According to the ways of the world. Even as we lived our lives according to the ways of the world, we were spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. And when I, when I talk about being spiritually dead, what I'm saying is, in, in our you know, efforts to attain eternal life or, or attain heaven or, or be good in God's eyes, we have done nothing to earn our place with God. And we can do nothing to earn our place with God by our flesh. In so many religions, it, it's, it's all about what you can do, what you can achieve. You know, it's all based on this scale of, have you done more good than bad? Or can you do enough good? That's, that's every other religion on the planet. But Christianity says, no, we were dead. Dead. And a dead person can do nothing. William Barclay wrote this quote about walking according to the ways of the world. It says, uh, sin is life lived on the world's standards and with the world's values. That's what sin is living according to the world's standards and, and for the world's values. So really think about your own life. Think about, have you been living according to the world's standards and with the world's values? Like, uh, do you think that you need to, to measure up to a standard? Do you think that you need to uh, leave your mark on the world? Do you think that you need to have a certain amount of money in the bank account when you retire? Or, or whatever it is, like, are you living that way? Are you living for the world's goods? Are you living for what you can achieve in this life? A lot of things that the world approves of are not at all what God approves of. God, God asks us to, to be selfless. God asks us to uh, sacrifice for others. And, and so often these kinds, of, um, these kinds of ideals are not appreciated by the world because they look at us and say, you're never going to get ahead of like, doing that. You're never going to... Um, achieve what you need to achieve in life or, or, or contribute to society the way that we want you to based on you always giving of yourself away. Um, but the Bible says, well, the Bible lifts up this example of Jesus himself who, who died on the cross for our sins at the age of 33. A lot of people will look at that and say, what a waste. He died so young. And of course, it is a tragedy that the God of the universe would die at all but it's also the glory of God that he sacrificed himself for us. That's our example. Are we willing to sacrifice ourselves, our, our goals, our dreams, our lives for our neighbor? And it's really, this is because so much of the world, um, the reason that the world approves of so many things that God does not approve of us because the world is actually more in agreement with our adversary, the devil, rather than with God. Uh, at the end of verse 2, it says uh, that we lived according to the previous ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Satan, in this, in this verse and in other places, is, is called the ruler of the power of the air. Uh, that Greek word for ruler is archon. It means that it means a ruler, a governor, a leader. And some, some translations will say a prince because it's recognizing that he is not the ultimate authority, just as a governor isn't the ultimate authority, uh, but rather he, he, he has authority over him even. See, Satan did not self-create. Um, I, I read a book once, and uh, there are many good things about this book. I thought the title was a little off, but it said that even Satan is God's devil. God's devil. Um, the, the truth is, God did create the devil. God did create the, the angel who fell. And he didn't create the devil in his form now. He's not, God didn't create evil. He's not the author of evil. But he did create the angel, knowing that that angel would fall and even serve the purpose for which God had for him. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? a discussion for another day, though. It was believed, okay, so Satan was called the, the ruler of the power of the air. It was believed that the air was where the demons resided. 
that the demons lived. That since, God, since God cast Satan and his demons out of heaven, it says they were cast to the earth. It's believed that the atmosphere, the, 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 the air, is where demons rule and live. It's interesting that the, the, the belief in angels is more popular than belief in Jesus. Did you know that? If you, there was a survey not too long ago that asked people what, what they believed, and, and uh, it, it's interesting that more people believe in uh, angels than believe in Jesus. And in fact, you know, we, we derive our beliefs from the Bible as Christians, and we read about angels, and that's where we, we get this idea of angels and things, but there was, a, there was that survey, and uh, if you'll put that on the screen there, Zach, the, the survey, um, there, it showed that not only did Protestants, that's us, we, uh, but Catholics, of, co of course, believe in, in angels, but then also people who believe in nothing particular. They don't really believe in, in Christians. They're not Christians, they're not Buddhists, they're not Hindus. They still believe in, Jesus, in, in, in angels, about half of them, 50%. But even agnostics, people who say, I don't, I don't know what I believe. They still believe in, in angels, apparently. Uh, over 20% of them do. Even 2% of atheists believe in angels. People who don't believe in God. 2% of them still believe in angels. They don't even believe in Jesus. And yet they believe in angels. The truth is, we are all in a spiritual warfare, that's true, with unseen demons and, and angels around us. The angels, of course, there to encourage us, but also demons tempting us to turn away from God. And, and when we disobey God, we are aligning ourselves with Satan and his demons. Now, I, I have this discussion with people from time to time, but um, every once in a while, somebody, usually somebody who Maybe they used to go to church a long time ago, or, or maybe they, they never, they've never been to church, but they'll call me up and say, um, hey, I, I, would you come and, and, and uh, they either want an exorcism, or they want me to cast demons out of their house. So they want, they want one of the two. So I'll go to their house, because I, 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 I'm open to, I know that there's such a thing as spiritual warfare, but usually I'm going there to, to minister to the person, is why, is why I go to the person. So I go to the house, and the conversation is always very, very similar to this. Believe in Jesus, and these things cannot torment you. Because the truth is, yes, I believe in spiritual warfare, but a lot of times this is mental health issues, right? Where they just, they're going through a hard time. And they need Jesus. They need Jesus. And whether it's, a, it's truly a demon or not that's tormenting them, I don't know. But the answer, either way, is the same. Believe in Jesus, and he who is in you is stronger than he who is in the world. Believe in Jesus. That's the answer. See, we should never forget that we all rebelled against God. And we were dead in our sins. And only Jesus makes us alive. Verse 3 says, We too all, we all did this. It's not just unbelievers. It's not just agnostics or atheists. It's, it's, we all did this. We too all previously lived according, uh, among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children of wrath, as the others were also. Uh, to quote a popular movie, The Princess Bride, we weren't just mostly dead. We weren't just mostly dead. We were all dead. We were all dead. Uh, the, 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 who, is, who played that character? Billy Crystal? It says, turns out your friend here is only mostly dead. See, mo mostly dead is still uh, slightly alive. And in the movie, he's able to revive this dead person because he said he was, just, he was only mostly dead. That's not reality. That's not reality. And especially it's not true biblically for ourselves before God. Now, a lot of people think that Christians, well, you're just mostly dead, or unbelievers. A lot of people think that, that we were just mostly dead. Like, so the analogy the, the, well, the Christians will sometimes use is, that Jesus is like, uh, you know, the, the, the lifesaver. You throw Jesus out, and they can reach out for him, right? But that would imply that that person was only mostly dead. He was still able to reach out. You get that? Jesus isn't just a life, life, life uh, vest or life uh, a ring. No, we were dead in the bottom of the ocean. We were dead. We were gone. We had no hope. Jesus himself came down and rescued us, pulled us out, resuscitated. And not just resuscitated, because we were dead, right? He brought us to life. He's like calling out to Lazarus, come forth. And we came out from the grave. That's our condition before God, or previously before knowing Jesus. 
We didn't do it. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. We were dead. Not just mostly dead, but all dead. See, remembering it this way keeps us humble before God and before others. See, we can't boast in our salvation by remembering that Jesus is the one who saved us. And we, it, it's not that we were smart enough. It's not that we were lucky enough to be born in the right country. No, it was Jesus himself who saved us, who made us alive, that keeps us humble before God and before others. Remembering that, that we've all rebelled against God, who rem also reminds us that, that what we were saved from, it says in verse 3, we just read it, uh, we were by nature children of wrath as the others were also. We were also saved from uh, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and desires. See, being, being children of wrath means at least several things, at least these three things, but I think so much more as well. Number one, we brought, as children of wrath, we brought wrath upon ourselves. And we did. Just in, our, in the natural course of our lives, as we lived our life, we brought wrath upon ourselves. You know, as if, if you sin in some way, it's going to bring a consequence of some kind. If you, if you lie to your boss, you're risking getting fired, right? If, if you abuse your children, you can go to jail, right? So we, as, children, as sinners, as children of wrath, we brought wrath in our lives on ourselves. As sinners, we also brought God's wrath upon us. And we can talk about this various ways. We can talk about this in terms of um, you know, eternity, the life after this life, where we will go after this life is over. There is a hell that we want to avoid. I don't believe it's permanent, but it's real. It's real. The Bible says that all things, including the second death, are going to be cast into um, the God's consuming fire. There is a hell, and we all deserve God's wrath in the next life, but also in this life today. In this life today, we deserve God's wrath. We've deserved God not to bless us, but to discipline us and punish us because of all the ways that we've rebelled against him and hurt others. As sinners, we've also judged ourselves in wrath and judged others in wrath. And what I mean by that is even, as, even sometimes as people forgiven by Christ, we've looked at ourselves and said, I'm not worthy to be God's child. We've judged ourselves in wrath. And we've judged others in wrath. We look at other people in their salvation, or maybe in their sin, even apart from Christ, and thought, there's no way that person could be saved. We've judged others in wrath. Next week, we're going to see God's response to our condition. Our condition of being dead and children of wrath. We're going to focus on that next week primarily. Of course, we've already seen the solution a little bit this week, and that's Jesus himself. Jesus. Although we deserve God's wrath, God shows us mercy. God shows us his mercy. It's not based on anything that we've done, but based completely on God's love, God's goodness. See, it's God's Goodness, God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not our re repentance that deserves God's kindness, but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. God is able to rescue us even from the worst condition when there's no hope, when there's absolutely nothing that we could possibly do. God is able to come into our life and rescue us and show us his grace. God's power and goodness is most magnified in the worst of conditions, like Jesus hanging on a cross, dying for our sins. We could look at that, and as I've already said, it's a tragedy that the God who made us would die on a cross. He didn't deserve it. And yet his death, the Bible calls the glory of the cross, saves sinners, saves us, resurrects us from the dead, that we might know him and rest in his love for us. There was once a missionary who was completely lost in 
an African jungle. Um, it was just, there was no hope of escape. There was trees and brush and uh, fierce animals, insects. I mean, there was death all around him. He had no hope, of whatever, of finding out of this jungle. So he just wandered around aimlessly. There was no path. There was no way. I mean, how could he possibly find the way? He just wandered. Well, as he was wandering, of course, he was making a little bit of noise. And uh, an African native heard him and came to him and said, hey, you need some help? And the missionary's like, yeah, I need help. I'm lost. I don't know where I am. I'm going to die out here. And the, missionary, and, the, and the native says, well, just follow me. Just follow me. So he gets out of his machete, starts you know, clearing a path, and um, he says, I'll take you to safety. So the, he's doing that for a while, and the, and the missionary says, are you sure this is the right way? I don't see a path. Are you, are you sure? And the missionary asks the native, are you sure this is the right way? Where is the path? And the, the native just responds, in this place, there is no path. I am the path. Follow me. See, Jesus came when there was no way. There was no way. We couldn't make ourselves righteous before God. We couldn't uh, do enough good so that God would allow us into heaven. God is perfect in every way. And we've all fallen short. We were all dead. Not only were we lost, but we were dead. But Jesus, Jesus himself, is the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to God apart from him, but in him, in him, we find our life. We are no longer dead. We are alive in Christ. If you've never trusted in Jesus, followed him in baptism, I invite you this morning to, to come to 